to stand. Now he runs. He produces a magic trick. He pulls out another one. This is incredible. This is ridiculous. This is 15 out of 10 of the incredible murder. What a player. What an entertainer. Give him the medal. Give him the Delhi M medal. Hello, footy fans, and welcome back to the Chip and Chase podcast. We're back here, ready to dig in to round 17, everything that happened in round 17 of the NRL Telstra Premiership season, getting our round review out and about. Sorry for the late recording. Uh, There's a bit of construction that's going on in the neighbor's house, a new house being put in. So I've had no power until just about now where I've finally sat down to do this, which also means if you guys hear any sort of background noise, I really apologize. I'll do my best to edit that sort of out uh, in post-production but let's kick things off I do not have all the time in the world at my disposal this is why I normally do these a bit earlier during the day but let's start things with my team of the week now if you guys don't know we do put a graphic up for this one this is over on the Instagram at chip and chase podcast so if you guys aren't following go ahead and do so but we'll quickly run through that at fullback for our round 17 team of the week we had to go with James Tedesco in the final game of the round uh, he's been absolutely stellar this season despite what many people think saying he's washed and whatnot I think he's been one of the form fullbacks of the competition probably second behind Dylan Edwards this year for consistency and everything I genuinely think so and yeah he's just come out and put out another great performance we'll look a bit deeper into his stats when we get to the game but he edged out the likes of Dane Laurie who I thought had a great game as well but I guess Dane Laurie in a defeat versus James Tedesco in a victory a pretty extensive victory at that Uh, that's the sort of deal breaker in this one so Tedesco is our fullback into our wingers. We've gone with Greg Marju as one of ours, as well as Dominic Young. Both of these players scoring doubles over the weekend. Uh, both playing really good good games in their own respective right. Marju, we know what he does. He just works through so much work, gets through 200 plus metres almost every game. Meanwhile, Dominic Young, uh, he's normally sort of just sitting on that wing, scoring some great tries and using his speed to get by. These two, of course, teammates last year. Uh, but in this game, he was doing a lot of work, lots of tackle breaks, lots of runs up the middle. He was very, very hard to contain. So I thought he was spectacular and that's why I gave him the other wing position. Over the likes of someone like his wing partner, for instance, Daniel Tupo, who had another great game himself. Uh, into the centres, this was a bit of a hard one. One of them, not so much, which we'll get to. But we'll start with our first centre, which is Moses Suli. Now, again, weren't too many standout centre performances over the weekend. Uh, I thought Jesse Ramian, of course, had a really good game. And, you know, you look at his stats and they probably match up even better than Moses Suli's. But watching that Dragons game, the defensive work Moses Suli got through was extraordinary. He saved countless attacking raids. I thought he was absolutely fantastic. So he gets to be one of our centers. And the other one, I'm sure that's quite obvious. We've gone with Bradman Best with one of the all-time individual performances. Again, we'll read through those stats in a bit, but I genuinely think he's the best in, like, when he's on the park, of course, he's he's had some, had some deficiencies with his injuries across, you know, Every season, essentially, last year, I think, was maybe the only season that he's got through a full year. And he's missed a bit of game time this year with that hamstring injury. But coming back, I think he's the most well-rounded centre in the game. You know, you have your Stephen Crichtons and whatnot, but I think Bradman Best offers more attacking flair. I'd argue he offers more hard work. And I think he's right up there with the defensive efforts of uh, Stephen Crichton. I think Bradman's one of the best, most informed centres in the competition. And this game, it just goes to show that. So we'll talk about that a bit more, but absolutely outstanding performance from Bradman Best. Into the halves, we've gone with the Warriors duo of Chanel Harris-Tavita and Tamare Martin. Tamare speaks for himself. One try, three try assists. He's just sort of making a habit of three plus try assist games. And then he's throwing in a couple tries every now and then to boot. Just when he's in that halfback jersey, he's absolutely killing it. I'm not sure what the Warriors are to do. Obviously, I'm a Warriors fan. I'm a massive Sean Johnson fan. Uh, The stats of Tamare Martin, what's that now? Four wins or five wins in five games at halfback, while Sean's, I think, three and nine or three and eight or something this season. Uh, 
I think they have to make it work. Chanel Harris Tavita was good in this one. Wasn't just his two tries that he scored, but his defensive efforts were fantastic, which he's been known for. Again, we'll speak a bit more on the whole Warriors halfback and will halves conundrum when we get to that game. But these two, they make the team of the week. Into the front row forwards, we've gone with another Warrior, Mitch Barnett, originally named in the back row, but before game time, he was switched to front row. So he had the number 12 on his back, but he was out there playing in the front row. And he just goes to show why I think he's the um, been the best front row in the NRL this year. I, I don't know who would even be up for debate. Adam Fenua Blake has had a, a quiet few weeks, probably about four or five weeks in the trot from Adam. Uh, Payne Haas has been good, but not as to his, his very best, and also in and out with origin and injury and whatnot. I don't think there's anyone that's really coming close to, which, to what Mitch Barnett is producing this year. And another fantastic performance in this game sees him into our team of the week. We've gone with Josh King back to back as the front row partner. Another try for Josh King off a, off a beautiful ball from Bronson Garlic. Um, but beyond that, he gets through about 70 minutes a game and just tackles his ass off, never misses a tackle, uh, works hard. I thought he was really, really good. I, I I think he was better this week than he was last week when he made my team of the week as well. Um, our hooker for team of the week in round 17. We've gone with Bronson Garlic. I was very much tossing up between him and Reed Marnie. Reed Marnie played a fantastic game on that Friday night game against the Sharkies. We'll get into that one soon. Uh, but Bronson Garlic, in a bit of a stinker, I won't lie, the, the Storm... The Storm Raiders game was a bit of a stink fest, but the way he played, his ruck recognition and the danger and balls he was throwing from dummy half were Harry Grant-esque. They really were. So I thought he had a really great game. I don't think the Storm win that without him, to be honest, because he threw some fantastic balls that kept them in the game. Um, so, yeah, Bronson Garlic is hooker. And the thing is, that also gave me a little bit, whether, whether or not it uh, should, should really count for it. But I figure... Reed Marnie, he's probably going to get a lot more team of the weeks over the over the rest of this year and the rest of his career. I don't know how many more Bronson Garlic gets, so thought we better give him his nod here. He was fantastic. Shout out Bronson Garlic. Into our back rowers, we've gone with Jaden Sewer from the Dragons. He had an excellent game. One of my faves from this year. You guys all know that I pointed him out at the beginning of the season and said he was in for a career year. I think he's very much doing that. Playing the best footy I've ever seen of him. Thought he was fantastic. And we've gone with Victor Radley. There were a few other options at second row. None like extensively amazing performances. But I think Victor Radley had a very much an eight and a half out of ten sort of game. Capped off with a, a try late in the game, which, which really helped. Put some really good shots on. Good in defense. I still want him back at lock forward. But as you'll see with our lock forward of Connor Watson, maybe it can't be done at the moment because he is our lock of the week. Uh, he got it just over Cameron McInnes, who I thought was for sure getting that position with his work in that Friday night game. But Connor Watson... Yeah, the way he plays, doesn't matter what position he's in, to be honest. He just sees a footballer. He's an out-and-out gun. Love having him as a New South Wales man. I want more out of him in Game 3, not out of him necessarily uh, his performance, but I'd love to see more minutes into him because he's a game-breaker. He works hard. He's just a weapon. So Connor Watson is our lock for this team of the week. Now, our bench, we'll quickly read through this. If you guys don't know, our selection criteria for this is the number 14 is the player... The best back who didn't quite make the starting 17. The number 15 is the best spine player who didn't make the starting 17. Number 16 is the best forward who didn't make the starting 17. And number 17 is my best bench player of the round. So number 14, our best back, Daniel Tupo. We mentioned him in the talk for the wingers, but just edged out by them. But he's made his way onto the bench with a two-try performance, just under 200 metres. Great game from Daniel Tupo. We've gone with Mitchell Moses at halfback. A lot of people... Really here for uh, Jerome Hughes' performance in that in that uh, Raiders game. Hughes was good, but I think what Mitchell Moses, I know in a losing effort, I thought he was fantastic. Dane Laurie was another good one here. Reed Marnie, another option. Lots of good spine players this week, but I thought Mitch Moses coming back from origin and trying to hype his team up. He nearly did so. The Eels were right in that game. Didn't get the Chockeys, but no fault through Mitchell Moses. Uh, our best forward, we went with Cameron McInnes. We did just mention him talking about Connor Watson. Absolute workhorse, absolute weapon. He gets our best forward. And lastly, the best bench player of the round. We've gone with Junior Paolo. One of his, uh, might be his second or third entry in the team of the week this season. I love the role he plays off the bench at the moment, the offloads he brings. And he got himself a nice cheeky try to boot as well. So, so that one is our team of the week for round 17, guys. Once again, that's over up on Instagram. So if you guys want to 
Let me know who you, who you thought should have made the team or whatnot. You can comment on that or send me a DM. So head over to the Instagram and let me know what you guys think. Be respectful. This is all just opinions. I'm not basing this off, you know, NRL necessarily. I'm just thinking who I thought stood out in whatever facets that I see fit. So let me know who you guys think should have made it. Let's move into the actual round review, starting with the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs defeating the Cronulla Sharks 15 to 14. Great game to open our round 17 fixtures. Uh, these two teams went at it very back and forth. I really, really enjoyed this game. I do think, I'll get it out of the way now, I think the better side lost, to be honest, but that's not necessarily saying that the Bulldogs are the worst side, if you get me. I think there was a point during the, the week, I think it might have been that Knights, uh, Knights-Eels game that one of the commentators, might have been Vossi, said that, the Knights deserve to be in front, but the Eels don't deserve to be behind. And I'm like, that's so fair. That's how I felt with this game. I thought the Sharks had the swing of momentum. They were the better side in that second half. I mean, they scored more tries than the Bulldogs in general, three tries to two. Um, Nico Hines, if he kicks any more than one of his three goals, they win. If just if he kicks his field goal in extra time, they win. If Braden Trindle kicks his field goal in extra time, they win. The Sharks had their chances and they couldn't ice them. And the Bulldogs ended up getting a beautiful field goal from Matt Burton in extra time, which was absolutely outstanding. I thought leading into that, however, there was a six again called leading into extra time. That is, there's a six again called with about a minute or two to play on Jesse Ramian when he didn't do anything. Um, which I might have been a little bit before that. Anyway, a six again, which then led to a penalty. It was a six again, like the fifth, fourth or fifth tackle too. And yeah, I thought that was very harsh. And then it led to a penalty where Toby Rudolph tackled, uh, might have been Toby Sexton or someone off the ball. And fair enough, that, that that's, a, that's a fair enough penalty. But I don't think they should have had the field position coming into that. Then the Sharks coming back from that working their way up the field, making great meters. There's a stoppage for a streaker, which is fair enough. You can't do anything again about that. Uh, then there's a stoppage for, I think there was one or two stoppages to say, take it back to the mark when the Sharkies players like really just didn't move off the mark in the first place. It was just a, a whole punch in the gut to their momentum. And it really, uh, really, yeah, it, it took its toll. I thought the Sharks were the better side. I thought they should have won this, but they didn't. And the Bulldogs, they asked their opportunities while the Sharks didn't. So you can't be too critical. I'm not saying the Bulldogs were poor at all. I thought they were really, really good. It goes to show how good of a defensive unit they are to be keeping the Sharks to only three tries and 14 points. It's really, really impressive. I think Bulldogs now, maybe they, they locked themselves in a while ago, but for me, this is they've locked themselves in as a top eight side. Unless there's an absolute capitulation like the, the Rabbitohs of yesteryear, I think this Bulldogs side is a top eight side. And it's it's really crazy to see the turnaround from last year, even the previous years. But you still look at this side on paper and I still think they're missing in a few positions and they're doing what they're doing. So a massive shout out to them. Really, really great game of football. Let's start with the Sharkies uh, standout players, starting with, of course, their fullback, William Kennedy. Now, Kennedy's a really interesting one. I love the sort of vibe that he brings to this Shark side. I've mentioned that on multiple occasions. He's the perfect sort of player for them. He's not the most superstar fullback out there, but he's very safe. He gets the job done. There's a little, there's a few, you know, problems in his game. He's still really skinny, really light. Every time he's like fielding all these kicks on the full, which is great. And he runs back hard and he's very light in his feet. But every single time, maybe it was specifically in this game with the, with the Bulldogs great defense, but every time in contact, he was being driven back. The thing is, it doesn't stop him from trying. He still makes 20 runs and 163 metres. He had a great line break as well uh, coming off a, I think they might have kicked down the throat of Sione Katoa and Katoa hit him and he made great a great line break. break. That footwork was spectacular. So he, he had a really good game, but, you know, seven tackle breaks in there, one line break, the metres that we already mentioned. So he, he had a good game, but... It, it does stuff your steps up a bit up a bit when he's just not finding his front. He's constantly driven back, and it's almost making it more work for your team to to come around and turn around. Now, I'm not fully blaming Will Kennedy 
Again, it could just be the Bulldogs having that fantastic defense that stops that. But um, I still thought he had a good game. I just wanted to note that one while we're here. Uh, Sione Akato, I mean, you know what? We'll mention all of the, the outside backs in the same breath. We usually do this, and maybe it's a bit unfair to them, but they all, they're they just one of the most well-rounded outside backs in the competition, in my opinion. So William Kennedy, 20 runs, 163 meters. Sione Akato, 16 runs, 168 meters. Jesse Ramian, 22 runs, 193 meters. Kale Ido, 19 runs, 145 metres, and Ronaldo Molotalo, 17 runs, 131 metres. Uh, Sione Katoa, beyond that, still had that try, that really good try where he, he beat Bronson Jerry on the outside and scored. He had five tackle breaks, and of course, he had that line break assist um, to Kennedy that we already spoke of. Uh, my favourite, Jesse Ramian, you guys know I love him. He had the line break assist. I think he had a couple of to um, Sione Kato on the right-hand side, one of them leading to that try that Sione scored. So there's another try assist thrown in with all the effort that he went through. The thing is, zero tackle breaks from Jesse Ramian in this one. So pretty wild stat that. Uh, just, yeah, really love what he does. Kel Iro, he got through his work. Ronaldo Mulatalo, the kick he put in. So if you guys didn't catch this game, there's a there's a ball put up. I can't recall who kicked him. It might have been Braden Trindle. Uh, kicks the ball up. Ronaldo, he contests. He comes down with it. He's being held in the tackle on fifth, and he just drops it while being held onto his foot and pokes a little dime in. Braden Trindle, like, sprints through and scores right in the corner. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous try. If you haven't seen that, go back and watch it. That was fantastic play. And that's just sort of the the X factor Ronaldo Molotalo brings. So you got to love what he what he can produce on the footy field. Maybe you don't like his antics. Fair enough. You know, I'm not the biggest fan of him myself. But, um, yeah, you got to respect the, the sort of player that Ronaldo Molotalo is. Beyond that, let's talk a little bit about Nico Hines. I expected a really big game from him. I expected, I still expect it, like coming into the Titans next week and the next few weeks. I think he has to stand up. There's a lot of heckling and a lot of stuff being said about him. He didn't have the best game, but he wasn't actually that poor. It was just necessarily the missed field goals and the missed kicks that, you know, they could have won the game and... You look to your superstar halfback in those moments to do that, and he didn't provide that. I hope he comes back next week and has a fantastic game. If I was the Titans, I'd be very, very scared about coming in up against this shark side after this loss. Yeah, very worrying what they can produce. But um, I do think a lot of the stuff being said is a bit unwarranted. This is still one of the best halves we've seen over the last couple of years. He's a Dalian winner two years, seasons ago, and he's still right up there with the best in the business at the moment. And keep in mind, this is his third full season playing halfback like he's been a fullback, 5 eighth. He's Yeah, he's a bit of an old ahead, but he's been thrust into one of the better teams in the comp to lead them around as a superstar. He's still learning the game. I expect more out of him, sure, and I'm sure Cronall fans do, but I think some of the stuff that's being said out there, it's it's a bit unwarranted. It's up there with what I said, what, what I posted about the the fans out there critiquing Sean Well, not critiquing. Criti- criticism's all fine. It's when you go beyond criticism and you start being a bit nasty that we're, we're getting into some gray areas there and just we don't want to be doing that. I put that up on the story on Instagram uh, last week, I believe. Let's just keep this. Like Nico Hines is one of the true great guys of our game with all the work he does and how just brilliant of a human being he is beyond a footy player. If you're out there and you're saying some shit to him, it's like just wake up to yourself, like genuinely wake up to yourself. So let's just pause on all of that, please. If you're following me and you're one of these people that are out there saying this sort of shit, please unfollow me. This isn't the place, this isn't the community that I want to be building. So if you're out there saying this sort of nasty shit, just you're welcome to unfollow me. Thank you very much. Uh, but that's all I want to say on Nico Hines. Beyond that for the Sharkies, uh, Toby Rudolph, not the best game from him. A few errors, lots of uh, wayward um, offloads as well. I do love Toby Rudolph and the and the effort he brings. I thought defensively he was quite good. There was a couple times he was pinged for, um, what do you call it, uh, holding on too long, so he was pinged for a few six agains and penalties. Look, I thought he was left out there too long in that opening stint. He was gassed, and I think they had Tom Hazelton up by about 18 minutes into the game. I thought it was to bring, to relieve Toby Rudolph. He got through a lot of work against that Bulldogs pack. Lots of defense from the Sharks in the opening 20. He's a big, big boy, Toby Rudolph. I thought they left him on a little bit too long, um, but 
It wasn't like the worst game I've ever seen, but definitely not the best. Blake Braley, good. Oregon Kafusi. I still want to see more of Oregon Kafusi. I don't know what it is, but when he came to this shark side, I thought he was going to turn into one of the best front rows in the comp. Hasn't really eventuated, um, but look, if he can end up going to another club with the depth that the Sharkies have and they can give him just be like, look, you are the alpha. I think it's part of this Sharks forward pack and their game plan that makes it so different too. Like they've got so many great forwards that you just sort of rotate and you don't need to work them too much, especially when your back five's doing the work that they do. So maybe it's not necessarily a... a Oregon Kofusi problem. It's just part of the Sharks game plan, but I'd love to see him be the dominant or alpha forward in another team if the opportunity presents itself. The second row was Britton Nikita and CSF for Talakai. They both played good games. Talakai really, really hard to handle for the Sharkies when he was out there. Britton Nikita doing his usual thing, making a lot of tackles, scoring a really nice try to boot as well. Cameron McInnes, we mentioned. Let's have a quick look at him. Lock forward, he played 59 minutes, 20 runs for 170 metres. He had a line break assist, a try assist, seven tackle breaks from Cameron McInnes. We have players like Jesse Ramian getting zero. And Cameron McInnes had seven. He had an offload. And, of course, he made 52 tackles with one miss. Absolutely outstanding performance from Cameron McInnes. It's, I hate seeing players like this put in that sort of work and just get let down by the, the other players in your team. Like, he deserves a win. Any player putting up that sort of shit and getting through, it's not just, you know, easy tackles. It's not flopping on a player. We know Cameron McInnes does the absolute hard yakka, and he deserves a victory for every game that he's doing this sort of shit. So I feel a bit sorry for him, but I thought he was absolutely outstanding. I also thought Royce Hunt was a really good in his stint off the bench, and Teague Wilton. There was uh, Craig Fitzgibbon came out and said that Teague Wilton – they love his defense, which has sort of been a problem with Teague Wilton's game, in my opinion, from what I've seen as an outsider. While um, Craig Fitzgibbon, obviously a, a fantastic footy head and the coach this side, was set, was very happy to have him back in the side just with the defensive efforts and the leadership he brings. Now, I'm not going to doubt the leadership. He's obviously been a leader in this side for a long time, and they've known that coming through juniors. But defensively, I've always thought he's not quite there, and I thought he, even at times he's been arguably a liability. In this game, I thought he was absolutely excellent. Only 34 minutes off the bench, but I absolutely loved the the work he was getting through in defense. Uh, he ended up making 18 tackles for zero misses, which isn't you know outstanding by any means, but only 34 minutes on the field. And it was the the form of those tackles that really got caught my interest. So shout out them. Uh, but moving into the Bulldogs, let's run through their team. Of course, Blake Taff was at fullback, but he ended up coming off the bench and they moved. Who did they end up moving to fullback? Ah, Jacob Kiraz, which of course, you know, Kiraz doing his usual thing, 23 runs and 175 meters. It looks like a quiet night every time you watch him because he's just doing it so often. It's the same as Brian Toto nowadays. It's so... Just in the back of your mind, like, yep, yeah, he, he's gone for another run that you don't even notice it. And then you look at these stats and like, fuck me, they're just outrageous sort of stuff. So, yeah, Jacob Kiraz, I mean, I can uh, sing his praises every week, but I'll try and refrain from it. I thought Blake Wilson was good, tried to get through a lot of work, uh, very much swamped. I thought him and um, when they brought on Blake Taff with about 20 minutes to go, they took off Jarrell Skelton for it. And I thought that was really interesting because – the the back three, I'd say from the um from the doggies, were getting monstered in all of the contact. Every time they went and made a run, they would get they would make their run and get driven back. And fair enough, they're making these runs like twenty one runs for Wilson and twenty three runs for Kiraz, but only one hundred and seventy five. So you know, not quite nowhere near ten meters a run from Kiraz, and only one hundred and sixty four from um, Wilson. I say only, these are great numbers and I love the work that they're getting through. It's more so just talking about the the smaller bodies that they had and how they were getting monstered by the Sharkies defense. So to take Jarrell Skelton off, who was a big body, I thought was quite interesting in saying that Skelton in his time in the field, 15 runs for 119 meters. So it wasn't like he was making 13 meters a run himself, uh, but I thought that was a very interesting move. Uh, I just wanted to sort of highlight that one. Beyond that, Matt Burton, I mean, he kicked that field goal. He kicked the goals. He did miss two field goals, but far out. He can strike a ball. His kicking game is just unbelievable. He was very, very close to my team of the week. In hindsight, I probably should have snuck him in there. Just he can kick it from 
his 10 meter line and it ends up on the opposition 10 meter line. It's absolutely ridiculous. The way he was striking the two point field goals and they were just singing through the air. Unbelievable stuff. And I love, of course, when you miss a couple and you still step up and you're like, no, you shake that off. I've missed two. My confidence isn't shaken and I'm going to nail this next one. And he did just that in the extra time. So absolutely love that from Matt Burton. He is playing some really confident footy. This is the Matt Burton that we always knew was in there. Um, and I'm so happy that we're finally seeing that under Cameron Serraldo. Toby Sexton had a bit of an indifferent game, but not bad whatsoever. Max King, lots of work from him. Ended up running for 151 metres himself and making 45 tackles to boot. Reed Marnie, we mentioned, almost making our team of the week. Besides his little try, he was just a pest as per usual, getting in Nico Hines' face at halftime. And, uh, yeah, look, you guys know I don't like that. I hate the whole if you're – look, if you're going to be a pest, you should be able to get punched. Like, if you're going to do that, you should – Go in anticipating, yeah, okay, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a dick, I'm gonna get under their skin, and they're gonna retaliate. I just sort of hate that when you're doing it, you're only doing it in a game or in a in a league now that you know that they can't retaliate. So you're just doing it to be a dickhead, and I don't like it. But it puts players off their game and he and he managed manages to do it each and every week. So respect to him. Um he managed to pull out fifty-four tackles of his own as well in this game. So lots of work from Reed Marnie. Really love what he's doing this year. Thought he was quite disappointing last year for the Bulldogs in his first season at the club. This year I think he's been one of the form hookers of the competition. So massive shout out to Reed Marnie. Sam Hughes got through a massive amount of work. Fifty-three minutes from Sam Hughes in this one. I think that might be his top for the season. 20 runs as well from the front rower, 159 metres, and he even made 32 tackles himself. So really like that. Obviously, they earmarked him at the start of the season, not just us in the super coach realm, but the Bulldogs, uh, Cameron Sobrato, Gus Gould, they absolutely love Sam Hughes. I hope he can build into the front rower that they need at the club. Obviously, they haven't gone out and signed, and it a massive signing of a front row. They've chased a few, haven't landed any. Sam Hughes in that time is just putting up some great stuff. And uh, maybe they can just save that money and be like, you know what? Sam Hughes can be our man. They're, they're in the top eight at the moment with him there. Why not just let him run? He's still very young, has a lot more growing in him. So I love that from him. Uh, Viliami Kikau, good game. His kick chase is great. Scored that nice little try. Josh Curran off the bench, fantastic. Curtis Moran loved his effort off the bench as well. But honestly, just this game in general from the Bulldogs and from the Sharkies was really good. Almost felt like it should have been a draw in a way. Both teams, neither team deserved to lose this one. But in the end, one team lost. That was the Sharkies. So congratulations to the Bulldogs having a fantastic season. We will move into our second game. Let's try and make this a little bit quicker. Spent maybe 15 minutes on that game. And I'd like to cut them down to about 10. Whether or not I can do that now with the Warriors game is a different story. So Warriors defeating the Broncos 32-16 over in New Zealand. Uh, really happy with this, obviously, as a Waz fan. I was worried for a bit there with the Warriors, uh, with the Broncos coming back in that second half. But um, look, in the end, we got the job done. We got it done by 16 points. Levi won his bet of Waz 13+, plus, and uh, Roger Tuivasa Sheck. Anytime try scorer, so that was really good for our tipping little situation this year. Uh, look, I think let's let's just talk about Tamaro Martin right now. Let's talk about this whole Warriors situation with their halves. I am still firmly in the believer that we can't win a premiership at the moment without Sean Johnson as our lead man. Now the the, the tough part is Tamaro Martin's footy this year is better than Sean Johnson's, and that's just. It's factual. Like, it, it can't really be argued at the moment. I don't think – I think this is like Tamari Martin's cap and he's, like, playing some amazing footy. So it's not to say that it's it's a bad a bad ceiling to have. I think Sean Johnson, if he comes back after break, I think they do give him another go. Whether or not it's at 5 eight or not, I don't know. We're talking about – I think what Sean Johnson does have in his arsenal is, is a better kicking game. Now, he hasn't fully displayed that this year. There's a lot of kicks on fifth tackle uh, when we're attacking the line that are very just um, going through the motions, almost robotic, which I'd like to see a bit differently. I'm hoping that he can come back after the break and, and revamp his game and get back to that form of last year. I don't think Chanel – I think a Tamari Martin and Sean Johnson combination is still – better than any other combination. Maybe Luke Metcalf when he gets back from injury. People seem to forget that we were on a great run of form um, with 
uh, Luke Metcalf at the beginning of the season and Sean Johnson at steering the ship. I think at the moment, Tamari Martin and Sean Johnson are just two similar of players and they're not so much getting in each other's way, but they're calling over calling shots and, and whatnot. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the go is. I firmly believe that we still need Sean Johnson in our team if we're to win a premiership. And I think he needs to be the lead halfback. If we try it again and he keeps, you know, not performing, you make that call. Maybe you go back to Tamare and uh, maybe Sean retires at the end of the year. Who knows? Look, I'm obviously a little bit biased in in the Sean Johnson camp. I He's been my favourite player since I started watching footy, to be honest. But um, I, it's so crazy that we go from a Dalian, what, what would have been the Dalian player of like what should have been the Dalian player of last year and the Warriors top four all off the back of him to now where it's drop him, retire, and all the shit that's being said. People need to wake up to themselves. I've left... I've left a few Warriors fan pages and whatnot because of the stuff that people say. And it, I just hear that. I see what everyone's saying. I'm like, that's not being fans at all. Like, you actually do need to wake up to yourselves. Fair enough critiquing. Fair enough if you're in the camp of tomorrow, Martin should be the lead halfback. I'm not saying he shouldn't at all. I think he's playing some... The best footy we've played this year is under tomorrow, Martin at halfback. I just don't think we can win a premiership with him at halfback this season. And I think we can still win a premiership this season. And I want to win a premiership this season. And if that's to happen, I think it's Sean Johnson back to his best. So hopefully we can get that. For now, obviously, Sean is out, so we don't need to worry about that. The call will be made when he comes back. Things could eventuate. You know, Tamari Martin could go down with an injury tomorrow, and then Sean Johnson's obviously the man to come back in. But we don't know. Let's just worry about now, and that's... Chanel, Harris, Tavita, and Tamari Martin in the halves and having excellent, excellent games. Chanel scoring two tries, I believe. Yep, the first and the third. And Tamari scoring one of his own and assisting three. Just really good games from them. But I think what people are missing as well, like in last week's performance against the Titans, like we wrote that off, obviously. They've come out in the, the media and said that, Andrew Webster said that, yeah, look, we didn't talk about that ever again. It's done. It's in the back of our minds. It's not even in the back of our minds. It's out of our minds. It's done. The week before that, we went very close to the storm and we're still missing players like Mitch Barnett. Like He comes back into this one and oh, his energy, the way he tightens that offense is just everything about Mitch Barnett. And even Kirk Capewell back, I thought was really good in this one. They are so integral. And we didn't have them last week against the Titans. Will it have made that much of a difference? No. Who knows, though, because I think those attitude, maybe we're not that complacent, just don't want to be their attitude with Mitch Barnett in the field because I've never seen Mitch Barnett have that sort of attitude. Um, but I thought he was fantastic while we're at it in this one. But let's uh, let's talk about the Broncos. You know what? Before we get to the Broncos, I want to outline or just talk a little bit about the refereeing because once again, it's atrocious. It is, it's so poor. It's embarrassing. It's really, really embarrassing. So that Cobo no try was 110%, 100, 100 million percent a try. It's never not been a try. And we've not only been robbed of that as a try and one of the best tries we've seen in a while, like that was amazing athletic stuff from Selwyn Cobo. We've not only been robbed of that, but then in the same play, you make a wrong call and say that Charles Nickel Klukstad didn't make an official tackle, so you penalise that. So you get two calls wrong on the same play. How can you do that? It's just baffling. I've said it every other week. How do the commentators who watch these games like the rest of us, how do they continuously get it right and then the bunker continuously gets it wrong. It's disgraceful. It's the worst part of our game at the moment, the refereeing slash bunker, more so the bunker this week than the refereeing. I didn't think the refereeing was all that bad. I mean, there's always going to be complaints about refereeing, but I thought for the majority of these games, the refereeing was pretty decent. You know, there's a lot being said about the Raiders Storm game. In the end, I thought the Storm were the better team, so, like, go with what you want. Uh, you know, I had my little criticisms of the the Sharks Bulldogs game, but honestly, even if those calls are made, the Sharks still should have iced the game. Like, there's not that many things. Guru, if you, I'm sure if you're a listener here, you probably listen to Rugby League Guru, but Guru outlined that if your team, if you're claiming that your team is robbed by a refereeing decision, then you haven't done enough to win the game in the first place. And I'm all for that in like the majority of situations. You know, sometimes if there's a, it's, you know, in the games like that Sharkies-Bulldogs game where two teams are right equal, like, 
Yeah, yeah, you're very fair, close doing it. And then there's a call made at the end that's like, bang. And it's just so blatantly wrong that's cost you the game. Sure, you can have your blow ups, but maybe you should have won the game before that. Regardless, refereeing this week and this season has just been abysmal. I'm really up that. I can't believe we're robbed of that Selwyn Cobo try. And then, you know, I know, I'm pretty sure Dean Mariner scored off that penalty that they got. But A, it should have been a Selwyn Cobo try. And then it wouldn't have mattered about this whole Charnsnickel Klukstad tackle, which was so legal, it's not funny. But then they penalised Charnsnickel Klukstad. And it's like, what do you want about? Like, uh, you got two two calls wrong in the same play, and it's just abysmal. And uh, if Graham Annesley comes out and defends all these calls, we've just got something. Something's gone wrong, and it's so obvious that everyone out there can see it. Commentators can see it. Like, commentators are making jokes about the sin bins in origin. The commentator's saying, hey, don't don't rub his head. You get sent off for that now. Yeah, you're right. Isn't that fucking crazy? Isn't that just a joke that in state of origin, Liam Martin got sent to the sin bin for rubbing the bloke's head? Like, is that not crazy? Are we, what has gone wrong with the game? I'm all for... The sin bins for foul play. There was two sin bins in the Tigers Roosters game, for one for a high tackle, I believe, and one from Abby Corusau lifting. Or oh, Adam Dewey got sent for ten. I can't remember what his one was actually for. Regardless, both were fair sin bins. Like I'm all for sin binning if the tackle's gone dangerous, even if it's accidental, send them off or not send them off, but sin bin them because we need to promote player safety. But rubbing a bloke's head in Origin, nah. If we're sin binning that. What's the point in playing this game? What's the point of watching this game? Anyway, let's get into this Warriors-Broncos game and speed run the rest of it because I've spoken too much about refereeing and the Sean Johnson halves dilemma. Warriors, fantastic game, to be honest. Broncos, they were they were pretty poor. In fairness, you know, they had a lot of their stars out. Still no Adam Reynolds on this side. No Paddy Carrigan, no Reese Walsh, and no Payne Haas for this one. They definitely went in undermanned and... um. Yeah, it showed, but I thought the Warriors put on a pretty strong performance. I thought the defense was quite good. They held the Broncos to, to nil for 30-odd minutes, and there was just Dean Mariner's speed on the outside, I think, of, of Marcelo Montoya. That got them there first. Dean Mariner ended up scoring two tries in this one, but let that not distract you from, I thought Dean Mariner had an absolute shocker, one of the all-time shockers I've seen. Lots and lots of drop balls. And uh, the thing that sort of annoys me about this is when Corey Oates had a game like this earlier in the season, Broncos were calling for Corey Oates' head and he has to be gone and he should never play again. Dean Mariner has what I'd consider a worse performance and there's nothing said. And and that sort of stuff just annoys me. I'm all for criticisms, but you have to have the same standards. You can't have double standards for this sort of stuff. Uh, I thought Dean Mariner was really, really poor. I'm not saying that he's the reason the um, Broncos lost, and he's an absolute gun of a play. He'll bounce back, and he's still leading the try scoring of the of the competition. But, yeah, I thought he had a, a, a poor little performance in this one. In, beyond that, for the Broncos, Selwyn Cobo was quite, quite good, very, very hard to handle. I'd assume he has to come back in for Queensland now with um, – Xavier Coates that going down with that injury. I'd assume it has to be Selwyn Cobo. And the way he played in this one, you know, undermanned the Broncos side, and he still just came out and was absolute handful. 11 runs, 137 metres, two line breaks, uh, nine tackle breaks. He should have had a try, should have had a line breaker sit. Like, he was fantastic. He really, really was. Wanted a little bit more out of him. But the thing is, the... um. Broncos also didn't have too much of the ball, especially in that first half, and that being a 55 to 45% uh, possession split throughout the game. But the Warriors had a lot of possession in that in that first half that the Broncos really just didn't capitalize on. So there wasn't too many opportunities for Selman to get himself into the game, but when he did, he was outstanding. Uh, Ezra Mam had some decent moments. Uh, Corey Jensen. 68 minutes at front row forward, 19 runs, 185 metres, three tackle breaks from the big fella, and 50 tackles. Absolute war horse right in the middle of the pack against this massive mobile Warriors pack, and he's doing that. It's just trucking that. I absolutely love that. Meanwhile, his front row partner and Xavier Willison scored a nice little try. Uh, unfortunately, Jack Gazieski lasted four minutes with a broken uh, hand or arm in this one, which was really uh, disappointing. And I'm sure that threw a lot of things out of whack for the for the Broncos. 
Kobe Hetherington ended up moving to second row, and then they had Fletcher Baker in at lock. I think they might have ran um, Corey, uh, sorry, Tyson Smoothie and Billy Walters on the field for a lot of time as well, like together. Just uh, threw things out of whack. They were obviously short man, so we won't spend too much longer on it. Broncos have now lost four on the trot, though, so where they go from here is a big question. They're going to need to revamp fast. They are currently sitting 10th on the ladder, I believe. I'll bring that up real quick. But they're definitely outside the top eight. Yeah, sitting 10th on the ladder now. So they're going to need to fix things up. They have the exact same amount of wins as the Warriors now, but uh, they've got a buy ahead of them. So they're, yeah, look at that. The Warriors in their awful season have the same amount of wins as the Broncos. So they need to fix things up and fast, but I'm sure they will. I have complete and utter faith that they make the top eight. Uh, for the Warriors, look, lots and lots of good performances. Chan's doing what he does just with his 17 runs, 161 run meters, really safe. He saves a 40-20. He gets out of the end goal. Like he has so many moments that just get unnoticed, but not from Warriors fans. So I love, absolutely adore Chance Nicole Cookstad. Probably going to sell him in Super Coach though. Um, so love you, my Pookie, but it's time time to go, maybe. Uh, Dylan Watane is a Lesniak back, back, back in the try scorers column. Roger Tuivasa-Shek back scoring tries as well, playing really well. Uh, Chanel Harris, Tavita, Tamara Martin. We've already spoke about them in depth, but fantastic games from both of them. And Fanua Blake playing a little bit less minutes this week, 51. I think they didn't need to put him through a whole lot. We were pretty in command of this game. 15 runs, 164 meters that he still pumped out. But the big one for me, Mitch Barnett, 72 minutes at front row forward, and he punched out 18 runs, 184 meters, six tackle breaks, two offloads, and 32 tackles for one miss. He's an absolute weapon. He's probably been our best player this season. You know what? No, without a doubt, Mitch Barnett has been our best player this season. If he doesn't win... Our Simon Mannering medal. I don't know what's gone wrong. Uh, beyond that, I love the role Miranda Niacore is playing at the moment, running some really hard lines. I think we need that. I mentioned Kurt Capewell. He was really good, ended up playing 66 minutes and just looked a lot more agile. I think getting himself back into origin just did something mentally for him. So loved what he was producing. Eight runs, 84 meters. Tafanga was good. Dylan Walker was really good at lock forward, ended up starting there over Torhu Harris. Torhu has dropped very much significantly into a, a low minute role, which is really interesting. I'd assume he will work his way up into, I'd say he's got to be about 40, 50 minutes at least. I'd say about 50 minutes a game, but it's really hard when you've got, maybe you put him at front rower for, for spells, but I don't know it's really interesting with what the Warriors are doing, but a really good win here. Hopefully this can kickstart their season. They go up against the Bulldogs next week, so that'll be a really good game, a really good test of where they're at, uh, but really good game here. Let's move into the Knights versus the Eels. Knights winning this one 34-26. Really disappointed I didn't get to see this one. Of course, this one being played at McDonald Jones, so in Newcastle where I live. Uh, we had tickets. I just uh, ended up working that day. I wish I didn't because... Yeah, what a game this was. Constantly just back and forth. Really physical contest as well. Lots and lots of big hits right until the 80th minute. So if you were at this one or if you watched this one on TV, it was one of the better games of the week. Also one of the highest scoring ones, which is good. There's a few low scoring contests this week, but this one, not so much. These teams just went at it back and forth all game. And it wasn't really one until the final minute or the final two minutes where Bradman best scooped up a loose ball um, and ran the length of the field and scored to win the game. So... Yeah, really, really enjoyed this one, to be honest. For the Eels, look, it's it's a difficult one to cop because they're essentially back at full strength and they're still losing to a Knights team that aren't in the best of shape. But, look, it's 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 not the end of the world. We know what the Eels can produce. I still think they're, they're not going to be the team that comes last this year. I think they'll win a few to end the season. I'm pretty sure they've got a really hard run, but I think... I still believe in what at, – when this side was full strength, I tipped them to be top eight or around about nine-tenth. And they're back to full strength now. I still think they can win games against the best of them. But losing it to the Knights here uh, is quite disappointing. As for the Knights, it's actually a massive win. You know, you're sitting here, you're saying, oh, yeah, you beat the team coming last. It's it's not about that. It's not at face value. 
to score 34 points again um, to put on this victory at home against a team that realistically the Eels in their last few games have gone really close to the Sharkies, the Roosters. They've gone against some of the better competition. They're a good side and you beat them with a great f- performance here in front of your home fans. It does a lot. Uh, whether or not the Knights can make the top eight remains to be seen. They've got Callum Ponga coming back soon, so hopefully they can get a run for the end of the season. But this one would have done a lot, a world of good for their confidence. And uh, yeah, just a really great game. I'm sure everyone in the Hunter, you can just feel it when you're in Newcastle and the Knights are winning. I wrote an, I wrote a whole uh, paper about it last last year. No, it might have been the beginning of this year. Yeah, I wrote a whole thing about it um, beginning of this year, a news article about it saying, yeah, you can just feel it when the Knights are winning in Newcastle, like Newcastle is just, it's like the sun's out. It's like the sun's out more when Newcastle are winning. So love that for the for the city of Newcastle. Uh, for the Eels standout players, there's always their standouts. You know, Clinton Gutherson doing his usual work and getting the um, nice little ball and try assist to Blaze Talangi. Blaze Talangi himself doing really good things on the wing, scoring a double, very close to a, a, a third, which I think should have. You know what, let, let's have a quick talk about... Um, the refereeing again in this one. This one will be quicker because I've said everything I need to say, but I'm just going to use some more examples in this game. So there's the Mike Acevo knock on when he's diving for the line and um, he flicks it back into the field of play and they call it a knock on. And I'm like, what What are you on about? Like, <laughs> uh, again, commentators are watching. They're like, what, what, how is this happening? How do you get that wrong? Then there's the, um, the Blaze Talungi no try where the bunker claims he grounded the ball short of the line and then rolled it across the line. The freeze frame that they stopped on to literally say that those words that he's promote, he's grounded the ball short of the line and then pr- promotes the ball forward like via rolling it. This is a no try. He's lost possession. The freeze frame that they stopped to say that He's got the ball on the line on the first grounding. It's quite clearly on the line. The commentators are baffled. They're sitting there going, no, no. Mitch Moses' face is like, are you fucking joking? When you, when the, when it cuts back to him talking to the referee, it's embarrassing how everyone else in the world can see it except the bunker. But we'll move on. Just two, two bad calls. Whether you're not ripped off, though, Eels. If you're out there, if you're a fan saying we were dotted. You're not dotted. I think the Knights were the better team. You still had opportunities to win this game. You know, that first Bradman best try where he runs the length of the field, that is just, that killed you guys. And then you score not long after that with Junior Parlo, and you're like, okay, we're back in. And then you drop the ball again and let Bradman best run the length of the field. Like, it's just lapses in concentration like that. Those are the reasons you lost this game. The Knights were, in the end, the better team. Wasn't by much. This was a great game. I wouldn't have been disappointed if it went either way. But the Eels had their opportunities and they weren't robbed. So please don't be out there and blaming the referees for the loss. But we can critique them and say this needs to be changed. This needs to be better because it's not a good state for the game at the moment. And it's just, it's really, it's such a shame that seemingly everyone else out there can see it. Viewers, you know, players, commentators, everyone out there can see it except the bunker. But we need to fix this. But you weren't robbed, Parramatta. Uh, beyond that, though, look, as I said, very good game. Rest of the Eels players that stood out. Mitch Moses, of course, made our team of the week on the bench. In a losing effort, he scored two tries, kicked three, excuse me, kicked three goals for a tally of 14 points. Uh, he ran the ball 17 times for 145 metres, had two line breaks, four tackle breaks, and 597 kick metres with a forced dropout as well. Just an absolutely fantastic game from the man of the match of State of Origin 2. He's just been killing it. I thought Regan Campbell-Gillard had probably his one of his best games of the season. Maybe not his best, but right up there. Just played a lot. Was very physical, as we always knew. Was busting the line. He had a great line break at one stage. I can't remember. He went off a short ball from someone and just took off, which was really good to see. Um, but he was really good in his 64 minutes on the field, 13 runs, 138 metres. As I said, that nice little line break, and he had 32 tackles. He is getting a little bit slow around the ruck, though. He's just noticing that he's just he's a big, he's a massive, massive body, and people are getting around him. He ended up with seven missed tackles in this game. In saying that, lots of missed tackles across the board. Brendan Hands, their hooker, missed eight himself. Uh, there was yeah, essentially everyone missed a tackle except Joe Offerhengawi, 
Matt Dorian plays Tulungi and plays Tulungi made five. So there you go. Um, yeah, look, that's what sort of lost the Eels the game. Their, their lapses in concentration and their defense. You shouldn't be conceding 34 points to the Knights respectfully at the best of times. Um, but you ended up doing so. So, yeah, there you, there you go. Uh, beyond that, shout out Matthew Arthur for making his NRL debut, the son of Brad Arthur. He's a, the Eels have massive, massive raps on him, the young hooker. He's an absolute gun. So really excited to see him progress um, for the for the Eels for the rest of the season and into next season. Junior Paolo, uh, we mentioned him in his 38 minutes. He had 17 runs, 136 metres, two tackle breaks. Uh, did he make any offloads? No offloads from Junior Paolo in this one, but he did score himself a nice little cheeky try as well. So I thought the uh, the Eels weren't bad, and those were sort of the standout players for them. I also loved seeing Sean Russell's chase and Blaise Delungy's in fairness, but their chases on uh, Bradman Best away on that left-hand side, I thought that was really, really good to see as well. For the Knights, lots more players here as the winners in this game. And just, a, a t- I didn't tip them to win this one. I didn't think they could, uh, but they came out and proved me wrong. Fletcher Sharp. Just doing great things as per usual. 14 runs, 141 meters, two tackle breaks. Just sort of where you need him to be. This is what we sort of ask of players like Terrell Sloan. They're smaller bodies, him and Fletcher Sharp. They're young, they're explosive, they're exciting. But just work. Hit around that 14 to 15 runs a game. You don't need to be doing 25 like Dylan Edwards or Charnsnick or Klukstad or, you know, James Tedesco. But just keep yourself involved. Push up and support, which is what they've been doing um, yeah, so this sort of game from Fletcher Sharp, really, really impressed with that. And Nari Tuala scored a nice try. Bradman Best, look, let's talk about it right now. One of the all-time individual performances I've ever seen. 15 runs, 357 metres, two tries, two try assists, two line breaks, two line break assists, eight tackle breaks, and what's not necessarily shown on here through stats, his defensive efforts as well were fantastic. What on earth is that stat line? 15 runs for 357 metres. He just made line breaks for fun. It says he's only got two because I'm pretty sure the the like the two that he the two runaways he scored um, are from drop balls, which doesn't mean they're line breaks, but you know, technically you could if you wanted to throw them in too. He's just an absolute gun. It was a mental, mental performance. Now, we said it a little bit in our Team of the Week speech, but I do think he's the best all-round centre in the game. He reminds me a lot of Josh Morris. Now, whether or not he ever considered a Josh Morris the best centre in the game, I thought he was for, like, the majority of his career. You know, Greg Inglis was probably the best centre there was in general, but he played a lot of that time at fullback and 5 eighth and whatnot. When it came to origin levels and you got to see those two match up, I absolutely adored it. And sure, Greg Inglis came out on top, but Greg Inglis is an absolute Adonis. And if Greg Inglis was playing centre or Latrell Mitchell or someone like that was playing centre, they might be the best. But Bradman best on both like sides of the field, defence, offence, he's just an absolute, absolute gun I think he's an yeah absolute weapon of a blow, and I think um yeah I, I'm in the firm belief that he's the best center, best overall all round center in the NRL. But if you guys want to debate that, if you have any others out there, you know Stephen Crichton, he's he's done it all. He's won premierships. You can definitely throw him in the mix. Um yeah, swing me a DM and let me know who you guys think. Uh, but beyond that, beyond the just incredible performance of Bradman Best. Greg Marju came back to some try scoring form, scoring a nice little double on that left-hand side. I'm sure there's no coincidence. It uh, lines up with Bradman Best returning to the side. He also did his usual work of, you know, just a casual 22 runs for 210 metres and uh, six tackle breaks on top of that. Just legendary stuff from him. Will Price making his NRL debut. Scores a try. Awesome stuff. Look, his defensive issues have been noted, and that's why he's taken so long to get in here. Ended up making 19 and missing five, so pretty poor in that aspect. He also had a two ineffective tackles, if you want to note them down too. But, God, you could just see with him in the team, they looked so much just more fluent. He's a danger. He ran the ball a few times that just looked threatening. And to score a try on your NRL debut is so good. Seeing Leon Price, which is one of the all-time greats up in the stands, celebrating, just really good stuff. Yes, he's got defensive issues, 
work on them, put someone like Tyson Frizzell next to him and try and just get him a bodyguard. I think that's what you need. There's been a lot of halves. Like, this is the thing. There's a lot. There's hardly any halves in the NRL that are defensive, like, weapons. Maybe they're not straight liabilities, but there's no great or very few great defensive halves out there. There's. It's always going to be the weak spot, but that's why you guard them with a the second row. I think of some of the greats. You've always had, you know, Bo Scott used to, um, guard Jamie Soward. There's um Gordon Tallis as as a bodyguard of sorts. There was um oh god, who was Lockie's one? Uh I can't think of his name. The other Broncos player who was Tony Carroll, like all of these sort of players were their bodyguards for your for your five eighth. And a lot of the time it's an aggressive little guy because, or not no, not so much little, aggressive guy that Maybe you can just put it go out go out and put a massive shot on, and it almost tells them, "Hey, you don't want to be running this way because I will axe you," and it just scares them away from going at them. And you know, you've got Tyson Frizzell, who's a great defensive player. Just get some good defense inside and outside of him, and get him to work on his defense. But what he brings in attack is instrumental. Twelve runs, ninety eight meters, a try, two line breaks. It's just really good stuff, and. uh yeah, fantastic to see on his debut and his his little uh, post game interview was always a little treat as well. Love love when players forget they're on live TV and throw a few f bombs out there. Bit bit funny, but um, no, I love that performance from Will Price and congratulations on your NRL, de- NRL debut, Matt. You absolutely killed it. So I hope that they persist with him at five eight because he definitely look like when you sort of sit sit back and go, okay, if Knights were to win a premiership, who do you think? Are they halves? Do you really think it's a, you know, t- Tyson Gamble respect? This is with utmost respect to these players. Is it Tyson Gamble, Jackson Hastings? Is it Jack Cogger thrown in there? I feel like Will Price is an out-and-out 5'8". Tyson Gamble is the only other one in their side, and he's injured at the moment, so you can't put it on Tyson. I think Tyson... The energy and everything, the best part of his game is his energy and aggression. You can bring that off the bench if you have to, though. Then again, uh, are you displacing Phoenix Crossland and Jaden Braley? I don't know. That's something that they'll have to deal with, but I'm hoping that they give Will Price an extended run because he was fantastic in this game. Uh, Beyond that, not too much of note. I thought Adam Elliott was actually quite underrated in his time on the field. Just had some really nice runs, good hands, great tackling. I really liked what Adam Elliott brought to the side in this one. Does, didn't necessarily show up in the stats, but I thought he was quite good. Um, but I'd like to still see a little bit more out of Kai Pierce Paul. I think the Knights aren't using him as effectively as they really should. He's an absolute Adonis, and you can definitely use him a lot more effectively. He did every run he had, he seemed like dangerous or was breaking tackles or hard to handle. Uh, yeah, just, just want to see a little bit more out of him uh, and just see them use him better. But this was a fantastic game, fantastic win for the Knights. As I said, really wish I was at this one. I'm sure everyone's buzzing and I'm yeah really happy for them. Eels, look, maybe your season's over, but I think you, you sort of might have known that from a while ago. Doesn't necessarily mean that you can't pick up a few wins and make, you know, the jersey proud for the rest of the season. This was one that, you know, got away from them, but I'm sure the Eels will bounce back for the rest of it. And I'm hoping that we can see a more rejuvenated Knights outfit from here on out so I can attend a few more games and have some good performances. But, yeah, great game, this one. <laughs> Opposite end of the spectrum, though, the Storm and the Raiders are next. The Storm winning 16-6. to Look, let's be real, wasn't the most entertaining watch this one. Very ill-disciplined. You know, the rain didn't help. The conditions didn't help. Um, yeah, but it just wasn't the most fun watching in my, in my eyes, a bit of a bludger of a match, to be honest. But in the end, the Storm came away victors once again. Now, Ricky Stewart came out in the press conference after, and fair enough, we know what Ricky Stewart's like. He sticks up for his team and his plays, his boys. Maybe he goes a bit over the top some of the times, fair enough. But he came out and just said, we're on the wrong end of the guessing game. They don't. The referees just don't know what they're doing out there. They're just, they're guessing. They're giving one away here and, oh, you know what, I might give one away here. And while I didn't necessarily think that was the case in this one, um, it's a fair call of how this season's gone. Like, it just takes me back to that that Sharks one on Jesse Ramian. It just felt like, you know what, we need more viewership. We need a, a better game here. Let's try and get the Bulldogs equal so we can go to Golden Point and then let's give away a, a six again. 
I don't know if that's the case, and I'm not sitting here to try and accuse referees of guessing and maybe saying that they're guessing is a bit of a hard call, like they are professional and pay, paid to do this. And we don't need it. I really don't want a ref bash because we need more of them in the game. Like where we wouldn't have a game without them. So I don't know. I don't. I thought maybe his comments in this one were a bit harsh for the game in general, for this game, because I didn't think the refereeing was actually that bad. But yeah, look, it's, it's, it's not far off the point, if you get me. Regardless, I do think the better team won. The Raiders in this first half, I thought they were the better team, uh, but in the second half, not so much. They went into halftime down 0-6. K.O. Weeks scores just out of, uh, out of halftime with a fantastic length of the field try showing off his speed. And then they just never capitalized on that ever again. And um, Storm came back not long after and then not long after that. And then there was 30 minutes of just no points being scored. It wasn't actually that bad of a performance like from – like. The discipline from either side is quite poor, but the defense of both sides I thought was really good. I loved the Raiders' defensive intensity and grit in that first half, but their errors and everything were the problems. They just kept inviting the Melbourne Storm back, and you can't do that. You cannot do that. I thought the defense was really good, but you can't make those errors. You need to be perfect against sides like the Melbourne Storm, and they weren't They weren't good enough. The Storm, they get it done not as convincingly as maybe they should. I'm sure Craig Bellamy is disappointed in his boys, probably more so than Ricky Stewart's get disappointed in his boys, and they'll have stern words there. But, um, yeah, just a yeah, an interesting little game. It's certainly a game that existed in the 2024 season, I'm sure. I'm not, not – don't think too many people will be looking back at this one anytime soon. In terms of standouts for the Raiders, look – uh, it's always their, their forwards, realistically. Joey Tarpany just doing his usual thing. I thought he was really good. 14 runs, 147 metres. I still want to see him free the offload. Like, it feels so weird that we aren't... That's his best asset, and it's the best thing that the Raiders can do. Obviously, there's a, direct, a directive there not to, but, God, I just wish that the... Especially in a game like this, yeah, maybe it's it's wet and you don't want to be offloading because it's going to make some errors. <laughs> Respectfully, they'll make an errors anyway. Throw the ball around and get something started and just try and get the storm on the back foot and let them know. Yeah, like don't give them any chance to figure out what you're doing. But I thought, uh, yeah, Joey Tarpany was good. Jordan Rapiner ended up making the switch to the wing in this one with uh, KO Weeks coming in at fullback and Adam Cook, the star, the star halfback of their New South Wales Cup team at the moment, coming in at halfback. I thought Adam Cook was really, really good in fairness. I thought he was probably their best player out there. Says he's listed at centre here and um, KO Weeks halfback, Jordan Ralph and a fullback, blah, blah, blah. No, Adam Cook played fullback, uh, sorry, played halfback, which is interesting because I've been watching a lot of Canberra Raiders uh, New South Wales Cup games this season. Uh, Adam Cook's a fullback. He's an out-and-out fullback, but he's been doing a really great shift at halfback there. The fact that he's getting into their into the game now, and honestly, I thought he was their best player. I sort of hope that they keep him there. But it's it's interesting because in a few games before this, K.O. Weeks was going really good at halfback. In this game, I thought he had a really poor game at fullback. Lots and lots of errors. Did score that fantastic individual try, which is we know he has those moments in him. I don't know what the answer is to the Raiders. We always knew that, look, in, in general, this year they're already pumped, punched well above their weight. I didn't think they'd go this good. If they don't win another game for the rest of the season, which we know that they will, they'll scrap together the wins here and there. But they've already had a pretty successful season for what I thought they were going to achieve. I think in the coming years with um, Chevy Stewart as their fullback, they've got uh, Ethan Sanders coming, the the young Eels fullback coming, uh, sorry, halfback coming. Of course, they've still got Mitch Henderson, who who I'm massive on. He's absolutely killing it in their lower grades. They've got a lot of young players. I think in the next couple of years, they're going to build into something really good. Uh, this year, it's sort of a mis- mismatch of players that are great, but they're not in their best positions. Like Rapner at fullback does a job, and you love having him out there. He, he's not a fullback, though. Kyle Weeks isn't a halfback, but he's playing halfback. Adam Cook's not a halfback, but he's playing halfback. Like, there's a lot of mismatches, but they're punching well above their weight. I don't think they make top eight this season, respectfully to Raiders fans. I'm pretty sure you guys don't really think so either. And even if you do, I don't think you're winning a premiership this year. Um, but in the coming years, there's a lot to be excited for. They've got so many young forwards as well, and they keep signing more. They just... 
They're a good footy side, but in terms of this one, look, not too many standouts. The other disappointing thing from this one was Matty Timiko uh, dislocated his shoulder again and now is looking at a stint on the sideline. So that's a bit of a disappointment. And uh, lastly, want to congratulate Jordan Martin for making his NRL debut. Hardly got any game time, which is quite disappointing. I was hoping he'd get a little bit more out there, but making your NRL, NRL na- debut nonetheless is no lean feat. So congratulations to Jordan Martin. Uh, beyond that, the Melbourne Storm. Look, there's also, there's not too much to touch on here either. This game, as I said, was a bludger. Will Warbrick was quite good on the wing, making lots and lots of meters. I thought Xavier Coates was good as well. Grant Anderson, I've been really impressed with this season. I hope they actually continue to persevere with him either on the wing or in the centers or whatnot. But I've really been impressed with him. Uh, Jack Howarth scored a try but didn't play the 80. What happened to him? Did he get subbed or did he do a HIA? I can't recall that. I think he failed a HIA maybe. Um, but 61 minutes from Jack Howarth, scored a nice little try. So far long, he had a fantastic run, which, God, he's an excitement machine. The way he moves around the field is incredible. So, God, he's, he's exciting to see. I think Pappy's still in some doubt for next week. So, may, oh, sorry, Storm don't even play next week. Scrap that. Um, but, yeah, really enjoy watching Sua. The other one in this one that I think is really interesting is Nelson still only playing 33 minutes. In 33 minutes, he ran the ball 20 times for 176 metres, 73 post contact, and two tackle breaks. Get him to 45 minutes a game. He can do it. All you need to do is give him two stints of 23 minutes a game. Or, yeah, like 20, two and a half minutes a game. He can do that. He will be a Adonis. It's uh, really interesting how they're using Nelson and with everything coming out and whatnot in the preseason. It's it's all a bit confusing, but um, yeah, like with the numbers he's putting up in limited time, I want more out of him. Uh, beyond that, though, Christian Welch I thought was great off the bench again. Trent Liero I thought was fantastic off the bench. 100, 180 metres from 19 runs from Liero, 15 runs for 150 meet, 153 metres from Christian Welch. Eli Katoa was solid as ever. Josh King we outlined with his one try in 69 minutes, 17 runs, 147 metres, and 28 tackles. And lastly, I want to outline, um, what's his name? Bronson Garlic, who we gave our team of the week spot, coming in and playing hooker with his two fantastic try assists and line break assists to Josh King and I believe it was Sean Bloor, the other one, but both were really, really good balls and I thought he was really good as well. Knocked out a fair few tackles in defense as well. 41 tackles with one miss. So love that sort of stuff from Bronson Garlic. Great to see a player like him that's just waiting in the wings. So if Grant is out, you can just play this guy for 80 and he pulls out performances like this. Thought he was the best player in the park in this one. Um, But yeah, Melbourne Storm, they were the better team. They got away with it. Interesting to note, as we said, Xavier Coates leaving the field with about 10 10 or 8 minutes to go, somewhere around that. Um with what looks to be, I think it's actually come out and been confirmed a hamstring injury, I think, or another, just, I think it's another hamstring injury this season. Uh, Yeah. Really interesting to see what that does for Queensland. As we sort of noted earlier, I think Selwyn maybe is the man to come back in and just play him on the wing. We know he can play a wing. He played there last year, but they've got options. You could still even move bloody, Valentine Holmes to a wing. You could play someone at centre where he's been good. Uh, Kyle Felt is an origin player. They've got a lot of options. I hope it's Selwyn. Well, as a Blues fan, I hope they don't pick Selwyn. But as a fan that just wants the best players out there for origin, I think Selwyn Cobbo has to replace him. But really, really gutting for Xavier Coates, having a really good season um, and was has been really strong, really great in origin as well. So, yeah, disappointing stuff there. And... Um, I think that's the biggest headline to come out of this match. Yeah, you got the two-point storm. You're now four points clear at the top of the ladder. But um, losing Xavier Coates is, yeah, a massive, massive kick in the dick. I think it's maybe a six-week injury from what I've heard. So a fair bit of time on the sidelines as well. So have to see what they do there, whether the Storm and um, Queensland, they're in a bit of a pickle to see what they do there. It, it just sucks when you lose players like this in a game that's almost almost doesn't matter. I don't want to say it doesn't matter. It has put them, as I said, four points clear. So two wins clear at the top of the table. Uh, four points clear. I think I said that. I can't, I'm, I'm lost. But um, to lose a player like Xavier Coates, you'd almost prefer a loss just to keep someone like Xavier Coates uninjured 
But um, that one will do us. We'll move into the Dragons and the Dolphins, the penultimate. No, not penultimate. We've got three games left. We're still an hour and 10 in. So we're going to rush. And I apologize to all the people whose teams come late in the round where I don't get to talk about them as much. Uh, Dragons, Dolphins, a uh, really good game, to be honest. I actually... Look, the attack was really bad from both teams in that first half, but the Dolphins across the entire game threw up one of the worst attacks I've seen in a long, long time. In fairness, the Dragons' defense was fantastic. We mentioned Moses Sully in our team of the week and the defensive efforts that he came up with. I thought he was spectacular. He made countless try savers on Tessie New, the chase down on Herbie Farnworth, all of this just really, really good stuff from Sully. But, um, yeah, Dolphins did not offer much in attack either. But, um, look, I enjoyed it. I tipped the Dolphins and obviously went down uh, big time, th- threw a few bets on a few of their try scorers too and lost on all of them. But um, Dragons, really good win. Could have been even more. They missed, like, three or four goals as well. So they could, could have been a, a 32 sort of six victory for them. But, again, just a really, really good win. This is still Dolphins that are pu- putting up some great games this season. They're a top eight side. And now the Dragons, I believe they are a top eight side on the back, off the back of this. Let's hit that ladder real quick. The Dragons into eighth place on the ladder. How good is that? Uh, yeah, most people tip them for the wooden spoon. Whether or not they stay in the top eight, who knows? But if they end up at, at that ninth, tenth position, it's a bloody successful season for the Dragons. And wins like this, you got to look back on them if you are to make the top eight. So really emphatic win from them. As I said, Dolphins really poor. Uh, Wayne Bennett will not be happy with their attacking display. They just really threw up nothing. I was watching all the time. I owned Cody Nicarima um, in Supercoach. And, you know, I just love watching Isaiah Kato. And I watched the way that their halves combined and sure, the Dragons' defense was really good. They kept sliding and just kept getting up on them. It was really good. But it just there didn't seem to be as much uh, momentum. Like there wasn't – nobody was running their lines as hard as they should have been. Everyone was just sort of a bit lethargic in all of their movements for the Dolphins. And uh, the Dragons just made yeah light work of it and defended them till the cows come home. Uh, but beyond that, look – Dolphins, some of their standout players. Trey Fuller, I think he kept doing his things. I can't believe he's not a regular starting fullback in an NRL club. He's an absolute gun. Punched out 183 metres from 19 runs. Had himself a nice little line break assist, six tackle breaks as well. And uh, he even was quite good in defence. Had a few really good efforts as well. So love that from him. Uh, Beyond that for the Dolphins, Jermaine Asako was decent, had a lot of runs as well from a small body, making lots of meters. Herbie Farnworth, I wanted a lot more out of. We tipped him for an anytime try scorer. It didn't come off. Um, Tessie knew, wanted more out of him as well. He just, he seems too big. Or I think he needs to lose a lot of weight to be a winger or a fullback in the NRL. He doesn't have that pace about him. And there's a, there's a play where they actually get a bit of space on that right-hand side. And he's just sort of stumbles around. He doesn't really like sprint for the corner, which he sh- sh- most other wingers make. I'll tell you what, if it's Dean Mariner, maybe that's a bit unfair because Dean Mariner's a speedster. But if that's a Dean Mariner on that wing, that's a try in the corner every day of the week. Anyway, he ends up coming back inside off the right foot. Moses Sully wraps him up and drags him over the sideline. I'm just like, you know, that, that goes to show how good Moses Sully was. But Tessie knew you've got to be just sprinting for that corner. And fair enough, like he didn't get the ball in flight. It wasn't the best ball but yeah, I don't know. It's uh, he still worked hard. Seventeen runs for one hundred and forty six meters. But I don't know. Surely they've got someone. Maybe it is just to pull a tray fuller, or maybe it is move a hammer into the centers or onto the wing or something. I don't know. It's hard to know. But they needed someone there while um, Jack Bostock's out. Hopefully he's only out for the week with that head injury assessment. I didn't actually do the math to see if it, if two games would fall within the eleven days. But hopefully he'll be back next week because I think they dearly missed him. Uh, Beyond that, look, Isaiah Katoa, he wasn't bad at all. He still came up with his usual stuff. I think he kicked a ball out in the full quite early. or No, it was a really good play from Max or Matt Fiona where, yeah, Isaiah Katoa put a a little bit too much on it and Fiona made sure he just stepped as far as he could over the sideline while catching the ball to get it back. But... Little errors like that, sure, he's a young player. They're, they're going to be in his game. I'm not too fussed on that stuff. It was mainly just the, the pace in which everything went at for the for their 
Dolphins attack that I was um, a bit worried about in this one. And also no players in their um, forward pack running for 100 metres except for Max Plath, who um, yeah was working very hard in the middle, ended up running 13 times 108 metres, and he made, what's that, 50-odd tackles? Go on, show me. 55 tackles with one miss, 98.2% tackle efficiency. Mental stuff from a little player doing that in 70 minutes. It's just crazy stuff. Uh, But beyond that, yeah, unfortunately not too much of note for the Dolphins. It's probably a game that you guys want to put behind you. For the Dragons, we've already said that they played really good, really good defensive efforts. Tyrell Sloan, I love the way he backed up and sort of chimed into moves in this one. I still want more running out of him, but hey, they're getting the job done, so I'm not going to be too critical. Moses Suli, as we said, really, really good defensively, and he still turned through a bit of work with 13 runs and 126 metres, two tackle breaks as well. Uh, the FNA Twins, I thought they were really good. Matt, we already said about that great little heads-up play to to get that get his leg over the sideline and get that ball back in play. Uh, he ended up going off injured, though, so that was a bit of a, a, bit of a shame for them. Even before he went off injured, in 20 minutes, 28 minutes, he had 10 runs for 121 metres. So he was absolutely killing it out there before that injury. Uh, meanwhile, Max Fiennay was quite good in defence as well and just got through his work. Uh, the forward pack, it's uh, the biggest thing that's impressed me for the Dragons this season is their forward pack. We ended up with 102 metres from Molo, 15 runs for 130 metres from DeBellin, 15 runs for 129 from Raymond Fartala Mariner, 22 runs for 208 metres from Jaden Sewer, 11 runs for 106 from Blake Laurie, and uh, 13 runs for 131 from Luciano Le Lua. So lots to work on there. We didn't even mention Toby Couchman and Ben Murdoch Masilla, who I thought were really good on their in their time in the field as well. I really like the the role that both of those players are bringing to this side. Very much, you know, not thought about, not really talked about. They're they're doing their job to a T this season. Uh, Jack DeBellin scored a try, sixty seven meter, uh, sixty seven minutes, one hundred and thirty meters, thirty seven tackles, doing his usual thing. Probably came up with a few offloads. Where are they? I'm sure he did. I definitely remember a couple of uh, offloads. Oh, apparently only one. Oh, and and no, he, he got two offloads. There we go. Jacob Little was the other player I really wanted to talk about for the um, Dragons. I thought he had one of his better games of the season, maybe even his career. Uh, he scored another great little try just backing up. Seven runs, 69 metres, just was very much a threat out of dummy half every time he took the ball on. Someone I probably forgot about when looking at doing my team of the week, whether or not he beats Bronson Garlic or Reed Marnie, maybe not, but I thought he was really, really good in this game. Line break, try, four tackle breaks, uh, 42 tackles, 70 metres from hooker. Really, really good performance. Um, But lastly, the man I really wanted to talk about, Jaden Sewer. His performance was absolutely outrageous. Every single tackle, every run he made, he was just beating everyone. How many tackle breaks did he end up with? Eight tackle breaks for Jaden Sewer, as we mentioned, 208 meters as well, and a great line break assist and try assist. That flick offload out the back off the back of shape and then bang out the back to uh, Tyrell Sloan. Gorgeous stuff. That is the sort of stuff that Jaden Sewer can accomplish. And this is where I want him to be. This is how I want him to be playing the rest of his career, the rest of this year as well. Like he's he's such a weapon. And I thought he was spectacular out there for the um Dragons. The thing is, he wasn't just at second row too. He was moved from left second row to right second row, then right center or left center. Like he was playing in the centers at both different second row positions. He was everywhere on the field and he was making things happen no matter what position he was in. So I thought it was a fantastic performance from Jaden Sewer and that's why he made my team of the week. Uh, But yeah, honestly, really good game from the Dragons. As I said, for them to be in the top eight at this point of the season is outstanding. Hopefully they can kick on. I've got a soft spot for the Dragons as they are my dad's team. So hopefully they can make the top eight. Hopefully we can get all of our teams, as in my family's teams, in the top eight. That's Sharkies, Warriors, Dragons, um, and well, technically Knights, but my brother doesn't really follow footy, so we won't count the Knights. I also don't think they're a chance. (laughs) But um. Yeah, shout out the Dragons. Great win. Dolphins back to the drawing board, but 
they'll probably just rub this one out of their mind and move on to the next. Into the second last game, the penultimate game, we have the Penrith Panthers defeating, sorry, going down to the North Queensland Cowboys, 16 to 6. Now, when I placed my tips for this one, it was with all of the um, Penrith players in the team, like the Origin players in the team, and none of the Cowboys team players in the team. Then all of the Penrith boys got dropped. I still thought Penrith would do it, but I ended up putting a few bets on Cowboys with the line. I thought there was so much value in there. Turned out, if you weren't just Cowboys to win at four bucks or something, that's where the value was at. Jesus Christ. Look, let's be honest. Not, not, not the best game again. Um, there's a lot of low-scoring games. It's like teams just forgot how to score this week. And fair enough, you know, lots of Origin players out. You've got a lot of players stepping into roles that they haven't practiced and, um, you know, set plays that they haven't really been a part of. Lots of new plays in different positions. Fair enough, it's going to be a bit scrappy. This game was very much in that same mold. But it's just good to see these young players get their shots. For the Panthers, Dane Laurie I thought was, ex- you know, exceptional at fullback. This is... This is who the Tigers signed and who they had for a couple of years there. And these performances are why he was their player of the year. And, you know, I thought he should have stuck around. Obviously, they got in Dream Buller uh, midway through last year, and he just killed it. Dream Buller hasn't really hit any of the height since then. He hasn't been bad, Dream Buller. But stuff like this, this is what you can get out of Dane Laurie. 24 runs, 220 meters, 74 post contact, nine tackle breaks. He was just an absolute weapon. Very dangerous every single time he touched the ball. Uh, For the rest of the Panthers team, James Fisher-Harris punched out 66 minutes in the middle. And in that time, he had 20 runs for 178 metres. And he made 46 tackles with one miss on the back of that. Probably could have made my team of the week as well, but they did go down in this one. So I figured Josh King might have deserved a little bit more. But James Fisher-Harris... Love seeing performances like this before he comes to the Warriors. Knowing he can put out this sort of stuff is so, so good to see. Um, he's going to be a massive leader, a massive person in for us. With Mitch Barnett and James Fisher-Harris, these aggressive leaders in our forward pack, I'm really excited to see that. Uh, but, yeah, fantastic performance from him. Beyond that, weren't too many standouts for the um, for the Panthers, unfortunately. As I said, lots of um, players that were quite new and just – just getting in there and doing a job, and it wasn't the most entertaining game. Uh, I thought Liam Henry was a, a bit of a workhorse, got through a lot of work in defense with 49 tackles himself. Scott Sorensen made 45. Geez, lots of tackles getting around in this one. Uh, Isaiah Yo, 30 tackles, zero misses in his 56 minutes, backing up from origin and 99 run meters. There, you got to like that. Um, but in the end, it was all the Cowboys. Just seeing them come out and perform the way they did was really, really good. Scott Drinkwater got sin binned and still came up with a try assist, a line break assist in 108 metres is just a weapon. It's sort of like with all Origin players out, you can still just count on Scott Drinkwater to just produce brilliance. So loved what he did. Kyle Felt was really, really good. Scored himself a try quite early in the contest, which brought him into it's now only three players in Premiership history that have scored double-digit tries or 10-plus tries in nine straight seasons. And it's Kyle Felt, it's Manu Vatave, and it is Clive Church. Clive Churchill? Or was it the – who's the actual player who's the top try scorer of all time? Ken Irvine. I think it was Ken Irvine, not um, Clive Churchill, which is in, insane stuff. I think Manu Vatave has that record. I know he done it, did it in 10 straight seasons. Um, Kyle felt he definitely could. I don't see a world where he's not scoring 10 tries next season if he's still part of this Cowboys team. So really good to see that. Beyond that early try as well, he took an intercept to stop the Panthers attacking raid not long after and ran almost the length of the field before getting mowed down by Dane Laurie. Ended up with 15 runs for 190 metres and that try line break, which was, uh, sorry, the intercept, was, which was a um, try saver as well. Just really good veteran leadership from a player that you need that out of with all of these um, origin players out. I thought the centers were good in Purdue and Vilea. Braden Burns had 21 runs for 162 meters and scored a try again. Clifford and Townsend were really good. I just, yeah, really good performance from a lot of these players. Jason Tamalolo still only 36 minutes, and in 36 minutes he had 14 runs for 132 metres. You double that. No, maybe not double that. That'd be 72. But get up, what, 
What do you need out of that? 24 more and you're up to 60? And, you, yeah, it's just ridiculous what he can achieve. I still want him playing 45 minutes a game, but we're not getting that. And who needs it when you're up like this? Obviously, they've got it set to maintain, maintain him, and that's fair enough, but he's an absolute Adonis whenever he's on the field. And uh, lastly, Sam McIntyre, I wanted to mention, 77 minutes in the middle. He came up with nine runs for 71 metres, a try assist and line break assist, and, of course, where is it? 45 tackles for two missed. He was an absolute weapon. Harrison Edwards also 50 tackles. So good to see players doing that. And um, Griffin Neem, 37 tackles as well in his 46 minutes on the field and 118 metres. So really good game from the Cowboys. Really good win, I should say. Maybe not the best game, but you take these ones, especially when they're against the top team in the comp. With or without their origin stars, Panthers can't use that as an excuse because the Cowboys were without even more origin stars. So... I think it's a great win from the Cowboys. And again, they need these sort of ones if they're to get into the top eight. So at the moment, that sees them in seventh. So they are in the top eight at the moment with nine wins for the season. Log jam of play of teams below them, though. Dragons with eight wins has them one point clear of Manly on seven, but with that draw has them on 19. But these are the teams on seven points, which is one win out of the top eight. Manly Seagulls, Brisbane Broncos, Newcastle Knights, Canberra Raiders, and New Zealand Warriors. Five teams are one win out of the top eight. This is such a great close year. I'm loving how close it is. It's good to see games like this, which are upsets as well. So really good game for the Cowboys. And yeah, you just take those ones when you can get them and leads you into the rest of the season. Uh, But finally, let's get into this last game. I want to wrap this one up within six minutes, let's say. So a little bit less time. The the Sydney Roosters defeating the West Tigers 40 to 6. Look, I think everyone sort of saw this one coming. Tigers have been up for their last few games, but this is a Roosters side that are just relentless across the park in every single position. They've just got better players almost. It's you can only be up for so long, Tigers, especially when you come up against teams like this. It's disappointing to lose in the way you did, but Look, that happens. You also had two sin bins and Appy Corusau and Adam Dewey. So that's always going to make it tougher. Uh, Roosters, look, they're definitely in the premiership business this year. I think they can win it. I honestly think they might be my favorites to win it. I think they just have the best squad across the park. I know the Panthers, you can never write them off, but I haven't seen enough from them this season that I'm convinced that they can do it. And also just in the back of my head, I'm sitting here like four in a row. It can't be done. So I don't know if the Panthers will win this year. Roosters are probably my favorites to win the comp. If not, it might be Broncos if they can get their squad back uh, and get a nice run to finish the season. But here with games like this, I've got to say the Roosters can win it. Look, Tigers, very disappointing to, yeah, as I said, lose losing the way you did. Um, but, look, it's, it's a tough old year for you guys. I think this has you guys now back into last place, which is disappointing, you know, on the back of some good form in the last couple of last couple of games. But, again, we talk about log jam for points. The uh, Tigers, Eels, and Titans have all won four games this season. If they were to win four more, they're only, yeah, they're only four games behind eighth place, which, yeah, they're probably not making the top eight. Let's be real here. But it's a better season than last year. I still think you can not come last. I don't know who will come last. I hope it's not the Tigers. I don't want you guys to do it for three years in a row. Um, But in terms of standouts for you guys, not really too much. Adam Dewey, I thought, was really good again. For him to be doing the work that he's doing, coming back from the injuries he's had is ridiculous. 16 runs Dewey had for 171 metres. Of course, he did have a little bit of a line break in there, but... Yeah, Adam Dewey was good despite the um the uh sin bin. I thought Luke Lauli'i had some the the young winger had some really good defensive moments. Look, there were a few times he was beaten on the edge, but fair enough. There was also a few times that he was beaten on the edge when they were down to twelve or eleven players, so you can't really hold that against him. But there were a few times that he shot in and just jammed them and and made them lose the ball, which I thought was really good. So I wanted to give him a shout out. Far Tape got through a decent amount of work. Dream Bullard was was all right. He did have that really weird tackle on the ground and then just threw it forward off the ground and gave away a penalty for no reason, which was a bit odd. Um, but, yeah, well, what can you say? Lockie Galvin kept trying to conjure stuff up right to the end. I just love the way he goes about his footy. 
But um, honestly, beyond that, not too much of note for the Tigers, unfortunately. As for the Roosters, look, we've already said it. They're in the Premiership's business. It's essentially it's a complete opposite end of the spectrum here for them and the Tigers. There's not really anyone in this Roosters side that had a bad performance, in my opinion. James Tedesco had a try, 23 runs for 231 metres, two line breaks, one line break assist, one try assist, and 11 tackle breaks. Daniel Tupo had two tries and 20 runs for 200 metres with two line breaks. Satili Tupanua had 10 runs and 106 metres at centre. I thought he was good. Joey Manu was good. He had a try assist and line break assist while he was out there. The other big news of this one was that Joey Manu went down with a hand injury. I believe it's a fractured hand of some sort or a fracture to do with the hand. Um, so that's probably going to sideline him for like four to eight weeks or something. I believe any anything on that, you probably want to go to uh, NRL Physio before you go to me. I'm just going off uh, what I've heard. But yeah, that's really disappointing for the for the Roosters, especially in the, the midst of their sort of centre crisis at the moment. You know, you've already got Satili playing centre. Um Ponga, as in Junior Ponga, is suspended. Uh, Joseph Sawali'i is suspended. Michael Jennings has been injured. I don't know who they go with next week. Actually, they don't play next week. It's No, they do play next week. What am I on about? There is no bye next week. Well, there is a bye, but it's not them. Oh, I'm losing my mind. We need to wrap this up. But, yeah, Satili Tupanua, good. Joey Manu, injured. <laughs> Dominic Young, really good with another two tries. And as we said, there's a reason he made our team of the week. 14 runs, 177 metres, Three line breaks, one line break assist, one try assist, five tackle breaks was really, really good. Luke Keary was good. I love the way he plays beyond his little try. He also had that crossfield kick to Daniel Tupo for his second, which is I love seeing that sort of stuff. When you make a break and everyone's sort of backing up, instead of spreading it, just get it to a half and kick over to that winger, especially when the kick when you're kicking it to Daniel Tupo, who's uh, reliable and six foot eight. So like that. I love that from Luke Keary. He was great. Sam Walker did his usual thing. Uh, did stuff me around a bit as my captain and super coach. Last week he goes 12 from 12 from the boot. This week he goes four from eight. What's that, mate? That's like 20 odd points. I missed out in goal kicking. I'm going to need a bit more from you, Sam Walker. Um, but beyond that, he was yeah exciting as per usual. Came up with a Fantastic try assist to Dominic Young on the right-hand side. Uh, Terrell May, another try, another 126 metres. Victor Radley, another try, doing his thing. Connor Watson, 18 runs, 180, 192 metres from him, and he knocked out 29 tackles, played the full 80. I thought Brandon Smith was fantastic at hooker as well. It says here that he played the full 80. I don't think he did. I swear he came off. But um, maybe I'm imagining things. I thought Brandon Smith was really good. He had a, a great dart in that second half as well where he broke the line. Um, look, honestly, as I said, this entire Roosters team uh, in this game were really, really good. And what can you say, really? They're, they're killing it. They're just building into this season. That win gets them to fourth on the ladder, two wins ahead of fifth place, which are the Bulldogs and – oh, hang on. Look at that. The Cowboys have more wins than the Dolphins and Bulldogs, but because of the buys, they're actually below them. So technically, Cowboys could be even further than them on the ladder. Regardless, Roosters are in a great spot. I do think that, yeah, they're going to be premiership contenders. I think they can win it. I, they're my favorites to win it. Just their team's so good. They're doing this without players like... Um, Joey Manu for most of the game and Joseph Suali'i, which I'm sure would help. So, yeah, really good stuff for the Roosters. That one will wrap us up. I've probably missed a lot of things I wanted to talk about, but we need to wrap this up. It's been going too long. I'm running out of time. Thank you guys for tuning in. Once again, if you guys don't follow me over on the Instagram, go and do so. That's where you can request stuff and you can just talk to me and interact with me. We can build a little bit of a repertoire together, hey? So go doing that. Go do that. That is at Chip and Chase Podcast. But thank you guys for tuning into this one. And I'll see you guys next time.